Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Friends, welcome. Uh, friends of the museum and our friends from the Australian Broadcasting Company. Uh, our core mission, and I always tell you this, is to preserve, exhibit, and teach about our finances and financial history. And today we have someone that knows a tremendous amount about all three of those. Uh, Mervyn King was governor of the Bank of England from 2003 to 2013. Uh, he is a graduate of Cambridge and Harvard, and then he went to the Bank of England as chief economist in 1991. He moved to deputy governor in 1997 before ascending to become the governor in 2003. He's currently teaching in both London and New York, London at the London School of Economics and in New York here at NYU. Now, he has many accolades uh, to his credit, including being, uh, being appointed a life peer by the Queen in 2013. He's a member of the House of Lords, where his title is Baron King of Lothbury. He's got a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire. And my favorite, in 2014, he is a member of the Knights, or has been appointed Knights of Garter. Now, that is not what you think it is, but since 1348, this is the highest civilian uh, honor, or highest honor, she said, you can get for chivalry in England. Now, forget all that, because for many people, their favorite is that Mervyn is the president of the Worcestershire County Cricket Club. Now, we're honored to have Mervyn here, of course, and afterwards, uh, he will be happy if you buy his book to autograph it for you. Now, this book is different. This is not a tell-all book uh, from the head of the Bank of England, but rather a historical compendium uh, of how we got to where we got to, and then a very sobering look uh, about what may come next if we don't take some drastic action. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Mervyn King. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a particular pleasure and privilege, in fact, to be able to talk about my book in this museum. Because during the crisis, and especially in the most frantic moments of that period, I knew that I learned a great deal more from financial history than I did from any number of mathematical or econometric models of the economy. It was a study of financial history that gave me the perspective to think deeply about the crisis that we were facing. Um, of course, it isn't just this museum that has great artifacts of financial history. In the Bank of England, my favorite is that we have uh, a letter uh, written by George Washington, who faced a terrible dilemma at one point in the Revolutionary Wars. He married Martha, and Martha had come with uh, some investments she had inherited from her previous husband. And those investments included stock issued by the British government. But there was something different about this stock. This was partly paid stock, which meant that the British government could demand that the holder of the stock had to contribute more to the government to own the full amount of the stock or lose value. In the Revolutionary Wars, the British government decided it was time to call the full payment of this stock. So poor, <clears throat> poor Mr. Washington had this awful dilemma. Should he refuse to contribute to the British government and finance the enemy, or should he abandon his own investments, uh, um, and, or should he in fact pay up the remainder of the stock in order to maintain the value of his investments? Now, to put you out of your misery, I can tell you he decided to pay up. And so your very first president helped to finance the government against which you fought those revolutionary wars. <laughs> that wasn't my only experience in dealing with financial history. I've never forgotten going to Moscow for the 150th anniversary of the Russian Central Bank. And on arrival there for what was a, uh, a conference for half a day, followed by some rather lavish celebrations, um, I was told that immediately after the coffee break, when I would be speaking, there will be a special guest who was not on the list, and it was Mr. Putin. And that after my remarks, he'd make a few remarks, and then he would leave. So I made my remarks, um, talking about the friendship between our two countries, the great history. 
I had sadly found nothing in the archives at the Bank of England which related to the creation of the Russian Central Bank, but I had brought with me the passbook of the account of a Russian citizen in the late 19th century to demonstrate that Russian citizens did have bank accounts with the Bank of England and we had close relationships for a very long time. And there was something special about this rather beautiful leather passbook. It was the passbook of Tsar Nicholas II. Now this was of immense interest to everyone at that conference, bar one. <clears throat> and Mr. Putin, when his turn came, through the translator, um, said, um, he turned to me and said, Tsar Nicholas should have put his money in a Russian bank. <laughs> There would have been no need for the revolution. <laughs> all kinds of things followed from that. Um, all this was done in Russian, and yet at the end of his um, presence at the conference, when he came to leave, he stood up, looked at me with those piercing eyes, and said in perfect English, all the best, and off he went. <laughs> so <clears throat> financial history is, to my mind, crucial in understanding what is going on in the world today. Now,